go. All right. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, Patriot Night here at uh, ICC, and we haven't done a real Patriot message in a while. We had the Easter season, and we uh, preached about that, and we talked about some things there, which I hope that everybody took something away from that. And I have to uh, start out tonight by apologizing, because Pastor Nikki had a video all set up for us on Easter Sunday. And, uh, you know, when you get up here and you start preaching, you tend to forget about all the other things that are going on. So we didn't get to see the video that she, the clip she had put together. So for that, I do apologize. I apologize to you and I apologize to Pastor Nikki because she did put a lot of hard work into that. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about foundations of American truth. You guys, you know, I, I know that everybody likes it when we have these, these Patriot Nights. Um, we do usually do it on Wednesdays, but there's a lot going on in the world right now. And, uh, you know, we're going to take a little deeper look into this whole thing. And there's some other stuff that I want to share with you. Uh, we're probably going to do a little study on, on uh, biblical authority. And we're going to talk about how I referenced a few weeks ago <clears throat> about the abomination of desolation. So I haven't forgotten about that. And I know that a couple of you have asked about that. And we are going to get to it. I promise we'll get to that. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to get this message out there. So let's open up in prayer tonight. Everybody bow your heads. Father, thank you for this time that we can be together, that your word can go forth even over the internet, Father, that we use this tool that has been provided to us to get your word out there, to share the word, to, to share the message of, of your gospel, that everybody could just come to the saving knowledge of your son, Father, we, we were so thankful that you gave Jesus to us, that he became the sacrifice who knew no sin. He was a man who knew no sin that became sin so that we wouldn't have to pay that terrible price, Father. So we thank you for those things. We love you. We honor and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So, like I said, given what's going on in the world at the moment, we're going to take a little, little sidestep here and talk about some patriot stuff tonight. No, it's always it's always scriptural. We always throw scripture in here and we talk about these things. But we have to talk about, you know, how this works through the church and how even it's affected us as not being able to assemble in our, our buildings and our churches and, and assemble together. Uh, you know, that how this is a, a chipping away at the freedoms. And I have concerns with, I, I've been hearing a lot on, on the radio and, you know, on TV that what, what could become the new norm? I don't want people to become, uh, we talked about this, the familiarity, the complacency. I don't want people to think that this is how we're going to do church from now on, that somehow we're not going to assemble in our, in our buildings. We're not going to come together as a body of believers. That, that's just not it. It's, it's not the way that God intended to do it, and it's not the way that we're going to do it. <clears throat> and, you know, I bring this up because I, I see how some people are reacting to this. Like, it's okay. It's not okay. I have to tell you that. It's not okay. This is not how God intended this to be. So, like I said, it's Patriot Night here, and I have some things that I wanted to share with you. You know, what's going on now with, with the, the pandemic? I'm beginning to see in the past week or so, more so like even in the past few days, that there's, it's like there's a whisper of patriotism in the air. And it all references, it's like a resounding heartbeat of our founding fathers. So I, I have to ask, though, are those whispers a reflection, a reflection of a, of a revenant fear that the founding fathers had of the Lord? Or is it because these people see an opportunity to push their own agenda and somehow further themselves. Again, the, looking at this from a biblical perspective, a patriot perspective, a Christian patriot perspective, we do all things for the glory of God. This has nothing to do with our own agendas. It has nothing to do with furthering our hobbies, careers, whatever it may be. You know, we know here as, a, as, a, as an ardent patriot that the patriot community lacks a central leadership because a lot of people like to pound their chests and they like to say, I'm the one in charge, you know, and until you can kneel before the king and realize he's the one that's in charge, it's not going to happen. So 
you know, we pray for that movement that that stays strong and that those patriots out there continue to do the work that they do, to continue the work that we do even here in our church and our movement. So, but these voices that they come from our founding fathers, they, it's like they reach out from the grave and they remind us of how they really did have this fear of the Lord and they really, really knew the Bible. They they stood on the Word of God like it was in, it, it was just an everyday part of their life. One of the greatest things that I, I hope that our kids will look back on it. You know, Nikki and I took uh, the kids to Colonial Williamsburg this past summer. <laughs> there were things in there that I didn't even know about the founding of our nation. It was it was awesome. It was an awesome trip. If you've never been there, I, I highly recommend that you go and learn about that. But what do these voices say? You know, were these were these foundational truths that they stand on really the word of God? I'm, we're going to look at some of their quotes tonight. Um, and, and, but I want to look at, too, is what influence should that have on us today as a church, as a, as a nation? We know that the word of God doesn't change. We know that the message doesn't change. So what the, the, the founding fathers quoted in these scriptures that they quoted it's not different. It's how we receive that word that's different. See, we always talk about the heart condition here at ICC, and that's what changes how people feel about it. You know, I've been I've been reading a, a book um, that Pastor Nikki got me. I, I keep reading it over and over, and it talks about you know ministers in New England even prior to the Revolutionary War that how they <laughs> ministers were were. They were people that the community relied on. They, they were those that stood up for the faith, of course. They were they acted as uh, councilmen. They did all kinds of stuff. It wasn't that they were just preaching in their pulpits. They were in taverns talking about the ideologies of the day. See, politics was religion. Religion was politics. I hate to say that, that dirty word, religion. You know, you can, you can easily substitute faith was politics. Politics was faith because it was so ingrained in their lives. But the foundation of this country is clearly spelled out. And these goes, this goes all the way back to the words of William Bradford. He actually became the uh, governor of Plymouth Colony, and he was describing the mission of the pilgrims. Mr. Bradford said they cherished a great hope and an inward zeal of laying a good foundation for the advancement of the gospel of Christ in the remote parts of the world. That's from uh, Founding Fathers Quotes, the Mayflower Compact, and that was what he wrote back in 1620. But it's, er it's very evident that the men whom God used to lay the foundation of this nation were men who had a fear of the Lord. If you look at these quotes from our Founding Fathers and other national leaders, you see it time and time again. George Washington once said, It is impossible to rightly govern <clears throat> the world without God and the Bible. We've said that many times here at ICC. It is so true. The one I, I quoted the first chief justice who said that we should choose uh, Christians as our rulers. But in his farewell speech in 1796, George Washington said, of all habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Reason and experience will forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. We all know that George Washington was a man of prayer and who could really grasp the heart of God. He just knew it. He knew that, that God would dwell within him, and he had this amazing prayer life. He actually prayed, direct my thoughts, words, and work. Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb, and purge my heart by thy Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ. See, these are the things that these men knew to be true. These were the things that they clung to, and we're just seeing glimpses into who these men really were. Thomas Jefferson, we always hear how people like to tear this guy down and say he wasn't, he wasn't a Christian, he was a deity, he was this, he was that. 
you know, Thomas Jefferson came back around toward the end of his life, and he really became a devout Christian. Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States, said, God gave us liberty, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Thomas Jefferson knew the need of a nation to walk in reverence before Almighty God and to live with a biblical understanding of what it means to live in the fear of the Lord. Not to be fearful of, of how religion, some religions teach us. I don't want to say some religions. In Christianity, there are those um those uh, you know denominations that tell you that God is out to get you. That is not true. And we're talking about this revenant fear. This this you know it's a respectful fear of the Lord that we have to walk the straight and narrow path. Not because He's out to get us, but because we want to be with Him and He wants us to be with Him. But look at what the psalmist wrote about this truth. In Psalm 33. This is titled The Sovereignty of the Lord and Creation in History. It's a short one, so we're going to read the whole thing. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth, see here's part of what I'm getting at. Verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. Stop and think about that for a minute. We are in a worldwide pandemic. People freaking out. They're relying on their own, you know, their own minds and what science tells them and everything else. You know, this kind of brings back something. I was watching TV last night before I went to bed. And, you know, a pastor had caught COVID and had passed away. And the vast majority of the media preferred to choose this. Like, they spoke of this as something like mocking the church. Like his, a pastor minister got sick and died from this. The guy was standing in faith and they mocked him. See, that's the kind of thinking that's out there today, and it's insane. We have to lean more on what God tells us. I say this, if the guy lived in faith, if, that, if the brother of mine was walking in faith, and he passed away because of, the, of an attack of the enemy, he's walking with Jesus right now. This goes to what I said. We, we win either way. But see what this nation is falling into? Look what it says. Verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. See, like people say, oh, that's the Old Testament, Pastor. Why are you talking about that? All generations. <laughs> I, I, we have to, we're going to have to have a, a, a talk about that one day, about how people, because some people have asked me that, like, oh, well, why do you worry about the Old Testament or the New Testament? It, guys, I, I, when people ask me questions like that, I, I don't know what to say because I feel like that's a failure of the church in their upbringing. Like, how do you not grasp all this stuff? As Christians, how do you not embrace Israel? How do you not love the Jewish nation? So let's continue on. Verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen, right? The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. We've done study and study and study and time again. I keep talking to you about this inheritance. We have all the upsides and none of the curses of the law. How awesome is that? Verse 13. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. 
he considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse <clears throat> is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. That's a reference to the fact that you're not going to flee anything on this earth in this regard. You stand fast in faith in Jesus Christ. You stand fast in faith knowing that your God will deliver you no matter what. Verse 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Well, what do we just talk about, right? On those who hope in his mercy. Hope, guys, what do I keep telling you hope means? Expectation, right? On those who expect his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him. Because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you, as we expect you to do, to stand fast in his word, right? But see, King David illustrates to us the providence of God. America needs to take to heart what our founding fathers knew to be an absolute truth. The counsel of the Lord is greater than the counsel of men. Christians know that as a nation or as individuals, they have actually inherited his mighty plan. Therefore, they are blessed with his protection, guidance, and provision. That was a, a man by the name of Knight who uh, did an expository on the Psalms, and that's uh, produced by John Knox Press, if anybody's looking for that. Um, but it's just, it's, it's just talking about how the heart of David, right? And it, 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 he just, he, he had that. God told us that, it, you know, he's a, he's a man after my own heart. But when a nation and his people walk in obedience, there is an unspeakable joy. That was another exposition in Psalms by a, a man named Ross. The Bible, it was a, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, actually, is what the name of the book is. But Exodus 19.5 tells us this very same promise. It's very clear here. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for all the earth is mine. You know, that book that I had referenced that I've been reading time and time again, all of this started with that word that I just said, a covenant. See, this is a covenant between man and God. It's an agreement. It's something that God can't go back on. And it's, it's funny that we mention this again right here in Exodus. But see, these are powerful voices from the past. They're truths from our founding fathers from this nation, but they're biblical promises. They keep saying these things. It, it was in their very being. The prophet Isaiah has a truth that affects all nations on the earth. He wrote in Isaiah 52.10, The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Right? All the nations. This is the prophet Isaiah. You want to talk about Old Testament. If, he didn't, if this was only for the Jews, how did he knew that? All nations, right? We'll see the salvation. It didn't say the coming. It says salvation of our God. Luke testified to the ministry of John the Baptist when he spoke these very same, I don't know, same words, but the words of Isaiah as well. This is found in Luke 3, 6. He says, and all the people will see God's salvation. God's deliverance of Israel in the past, present, and in the future, what happens to Israel, it will cause all nations to fall on their knees and acknowledge the Lord. How many times have you heard me speak from this pulpit? You can receive the Lord in two ways. You can receive him with open arms, accepting all the blessings, all the grace, all the love, mercy, and peace that he has for you. Or you can receive him as king, broken and bleeding. Doesn't matter. So one day we are all going to see the glory of our king. In one of two ways, those who accept him and those who don't. But see, it will cause all nations to accept 
the Lord. The Bible says in Romans 14, 11, uh, 14, 11, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. Yeah, you know what they're going to confess? That Jesus Christ is king. John Quincy Adams knew these very same truths. He said, the hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Whoever believes in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures must hope that the religion of Jesus shall prevail throughout the earth. These were the guys who led, who they were leaders in their time. They were like, they were like pioneers out there, but the word of God was within them, and they stood on that word. These same voices from the past speak of the hope for every nation to learn about God's salvation. Amen? What do I keep preaching from this pulpit? The Great Commission. That is our job, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with all men, all nations. But they also speak to the benefits in the name of the Lord as well. Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. How many times have you heard me say, You can talk about God all you want. People will never bat an eyelash. You can say creator. You can say anything. But don't say Jesus. If you say Jesus, people lose their minds and run out the door with their hair on fire. Why? Because there's power in that name. Our Bible tells us in Psalm 20 and verse 2, May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. See, there's that inheritance again that keeps showing up. We get all those blessings in this inheritance with none of the downsides, none of the curses. Psalm 91 verse 4 says, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. We just read Psalm 91 the whole thing a couple weeks ago, right? Guys, this is just over and over again how we abide in the shadow, right? That's where we get our rest, resting in him. But we have to know his word. We have to stand on his word in faith. Again, we see the things going on in this nation. We know that there's a power grab going on. We see it. Again, we're going to talk about this biblical authority as we go on in the coming weeks. I'm not looking to start a revolution. So whoever, if anybody's out there thinking that, sit down and knock it off. Because that's not what this is about. I'm telling you the truth about the authority of Almighty God. And there is no authority above God. There's no authority that can compare to it. All authority comes from God. If there's no, if, if that authority isn't within God, then it's no authority. But I'll get in, I'll get into that. But see, in those scriptures, we find here is the God of sufficiency, of all sufficiency for his children. Christians find rest when they become weary, and they find refuge, uh, refuge when they're being pursued, right, by this flesh, these men of the flesh, these women of the flesh. The world, the enemy, however you want to put it, there's refuge in God. See, Matthew Henry said, as they diligently seek his will for them through the counsel of his word, they enjoy his attributes, have authority under his titles, embrace his covenant, and cling to his promises. See, guys, I, I was talking to Pastor Nikki even last night. I, what I'm telling you about the authority of God is not new. Pastors, ministers, three, 250, 260 years ago, 300 years ago, they knew these things. Something has been lost in the modern church. I keep telling you about this watered-down gospel. I was trying to kind of hammer this down with Pastor Nikki last night. We were talking about this. It's almost like around the year 1900, somewhere in there. I'm not saying it was that year, but somewhere around there, something changed. Something snapped. And we began to see the infiltration of this watered-down, feel-good-feeling, kind of churchy, whatever, make me feel good. All right? That's not what the Word of God is about. I keep telling you, there are rules. There are 
rules to all this. And this authority thing that you're going to you're going to hear from me is not new by any stretch of the imagination. Matthew Henry knew it. I always read him in conjunction when I read my Bible. And let me tell you something, that guy tells it like it is. Um, Corrie Ten Boom, uh, she was a Dutch watchmaker who helped Jews escape uh, the Nazis by hiding them in her home, understood this truth too. She said, when Jesus takes your hand, he keeps you tight. When Jesus keeps you tight, he leads you through your whole life. When Jesus leads you through your life, he brings you safely home. <laughs> it's that simple. It is that simple. Samuel Adams understood this very same truth. He wrote a letter to his wife, Elizabeth, on December 26, 1776. And he said this, Let us secure his favor, and he will lead us through the journey of this life. Right? These are the things that these guys would write to their wives. It was in their lives. It was what their lives were built upon and around. But the voices from the past also tell us to run to the Lord. He will keep us safe as long as we're at the center of his will. The voices from the past urge us to intercession to the Lord, right? Second Chronicles 7.14, we've all heard this before. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Amen? That's one of my favorites. One of my favorites. Does America need to repent? <laughs> Take a look around and you tell me. All right? That's called discernment. America needs to repent. They do. Well, the stuff that we see on the House floor, in the Senate floor, the words that come out of these people who were elected to represent the people of this nation. Look, I'm not judging anybody, but when you say the things that they say, I ask you, are you seeking the Lord? I'm going to tell you right now, they're not. Not with the words that come out of their mouths. But stop and think about the loud ignorant voices today versus the voices from the past. Before we do, I want you to look at the definition. I said ignorance, so let's, let's talk about that definition. Ignorance meaning lacking knowledge or information as to a particular subject or fact. <laughs> How often have we heard unbelievers? Try to school the believers, right? Because they get one little verse. They hear it. We, we see it all the time, right? They read one verse of the Bible, and all of a sudden they're a theologian, and they're a biblical expert, right? How often have we watched these people who claim to be believers, claim to be Christians, watch these conspiracy videos on YouTube or whatever, however they find them, and somehow apply their one little verse of the Bible to it. Oh boy, that's comical when that happens. Actually, it's not comical. It's sad. It's really sad because they start to pull people away from the Word of God. They start to pull people away from the truth, and they start to pull people away from the fact that this is a Christian nation. They start to tear down the founding fathers. They start to do all this stuff and say, that didn't happen. This is what happened. And this conspiracy video I watched over here by another another guy who, you know, he knew that this person did that. Whatever. Whatever. They're, you know, the founding fathers, they wrote all their stuff down. We have those documents. We see where their hearts were, right? How often do we see these people attempt to tear down the founding fathers, right? But these founding fathers, when they sat down together, they knew the word of God. And they forged some of the most well-known and greatest documents in history. I'm going to tell you right now, avoid these people at all costs. Again, we get people who... They, it's crazy. They, they read their Bibles, they think that it means one thing, and they just run with it. They run with it. They get people so sickened by the church 
that they don't even want to be there. You hear the, the people that are trying to get into the church talk about, well, why would I want to be like one of those judgy Christians, right? Guys, you have to be careful what you let in, right? I'm not saying that these men or women are general, in general, like our, our, our founding fathers were perfect by any stretch of the imagination. They weren't, okay? What I'm saying, they were men and women. You don't put your faith in men or women. You put your faith in God. But these men and women knew the word of God. But what I'm saying is that they knew that word of God and it was a part of their everyday life, which is a stark contrast from the alleged experts that we see today who read the Bible at face value without a true understanding of his word. And I'm afraid... <laughs> I have to say this, and these people who do this are afraid to say the name of Jesus for fear that it might offend somebody else, right? Let me tell you something. Jesus, 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 Jesus. So I should probably say it 50 more times. Jesus, Jesus. If it offends you, turn your video off right now. Because I'm going to keep saying Jesus, right? Shame on you if that is you. Shame on them if you know who they are. I'm not saying you'd kick them out. I'm not saying you'd be mean to them. I'm not saying any of that. But you keep hitting them with the truth about Jesus, okay? Hopefully, prayerfully, it gets in there and they receive him for who he really is. I'm sure you've heard people say that America is no longer a Christian nation, right? Somebody watching out there tonight may even have thought it themselves. Look, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I, you watch C-SPAN or you watch some of the Senate hearings, the House hearings, and you're like, where is God in this? Like, but you have to understand, these are men and women, and they're not infallible like God. See, that's the key. <coughs> they're men and women. You can't put your faith in that. But like I said, it's easy to see why people would get like that. But we have to look at what history tells us about the birth of this nation and whether those claims about it not being a Christian nation have any merit at all. <clears throat> As we've already talked about, we've already learned, the Christian faith has influenced many of our founding fathers. Even so far back as we saw the founding of Plymouth in 1620. But despite that, claims that America is no longer a Christian nation, they persist. Often those claims are not refuted by anybody due to the widespread, like I said, lack of knowledge of, a, <coughs> I'm sorry, of America's history and the foundation laid by the founding father. All right, but even more significant, many of these claims fail to share a real idea of the concept of what a Christian nation really is. You know, many, I don't want to say many years ago, but probably five or six years ago, some words flew out of my mouth and I had said that America is the last bastion of, uh, uh, of uh, Christianity. And I was met with a little opposition with the individual which I was speaking because there, people are being saved all over the world. And I, I said, yeah, but fundamentally defending the faith, we are the last bastion of Christianity in that regard. See, David Barton from Wall Builders said in his book, <clears throat> it's called, uh, Is America No Longer a Christian Nation? He said this, Regardless of what today's Americans think, it is unquestionable that four previous centuries of American leaders strongly disagree with any statement that presents America as not being a Christian nation. He continued on, he said, The voices from our past, presidents, legislatures, court decisions, speak powerfully about America being a Christian nation. Research can tell you what a Christian nation is. A Christian nation is not one in which all citizens are Christians, neither are the laws required to be in accord with Christian theology, or where all the leaders are Christians. What it's saying is that it's founding, right? What we said, our leaders knew. All these things. Yeah, it's what happens. Look at the leaders that are out there now. How 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 we're we're split as a nation. People, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and then they vote to kill babies in the womb. 
five seconds later. <sighs> guys, I, like I said, I'm not judging anybody, but you guys have to discern for yourselves how that is godly. Ask yourself when these people say these things and do these things, what is godly about that? I can remember saying to a dear brother in Christ at one point, he, he was talking about you know someone that had said some things to him, and I said to him, like, okay, well, let me ask you something. Uh, the, without me commenting, I just want to ask you, what is godly about what you just told me? And the individual kind of looked at me, and he had his answer. When, <laughs> it's easy when you read your Bible and you know the Word of God, and you have that relationship with Jesus, to be able to discern that for yourself. Supreme Court Justice David Brewer wrote it this way. In what sense can America be called a Christian nation? Not in the sense that Christianity is the established religion or that the people are in any manner compelled to support it. On the contrary, the Constitution specifically provides that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. See, when we talk about that, that First Amendment, I'm going to stop right there for a second. See, when governors, whoever, however you want to slice it, decided that they were going to close houses of worship and they're arresting pastors and ticket was at Kentucky where the guy had the, the people ticketed for going to church and sitting in their cars. See, that's a clear violation of the First Amendment which talks about in the free exercise thereof. There is no law. There can be no law according to the First Amendment. And if you want to talk about authority, it doesn't matter because God's authority is above that. And it says clearly in his word, we are to assemble. We are to come together as one, right? He is the head. We are the body. So there you go. You want to get a little patriotic there, a little more deeper? Clear violations of the First Amendment. Like I said, you know what? Maybe God saw it coming. Maybe that's why we don't have a building yet. And all of our money is going for the building fund because your pastor would be in jail right now. Because let me tell you something. I, 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 it just drives me insane that this is what we've been driven to. But at any rate, Continuing on, right? He said, neither is it a is it Christian in the sense that all citizens are either in fact or named Christians. On the contrary, all religions have free scope within our borders. Numbers of our people profess other religions and many reject all. Nor is it Christian in the sense that a profession of Christianity is a condition of holding office or otherwise engaging in public service, or essential to recognition either politically or socially. In fact, the government as a legal organization is independent of all religions. Nevertheless, we constantly speak of this republic as a Christian nation. In fact, as the leading Christian nation of the world. See, all these things, we know who we are because we stand on the promises of God. We know his word. And these people don't have to profess it. That's why it kills me when people are out there, oh, yeah, you have the Ten Commandments in this, this public building. Get over it, all right? This is the founding of our nation, and you can't help it. We are a Christian nation. So I have to ask right there, what are these so-called experts basing their information on, right? We see our Christian roots everywhere, and we look back to our nation's founding, even before the founding. You know, Pastor Nicky and I were talking about this not too long ago. I don't think people truly understand who the pilgrims were. They were fleeing religious persecution to come here. That was who these people were. It was all about their faith back then. But see, you can't legislate morality. <laughs> all you have to do is take a look around right now. You know that that's not the case. And you can't force anybody to be a good Samaritan. But the biblical teaching of the Good Samaritan, though, has principles that can shape a person's life. Free will prevents us from forcing the Ten Commandments on anyone, as does our founding documents, right? We can't do that. We're not supposed to do that. And God doesn't want us to ram the, the Bible down anybody's throat. It's free will. But see, the Ten Commandments have influenced the shaping of American values. It is what it is, right? We're a Christian nation. American presidents affirm that America is a Christian nation. Look at some of these quotes. Thomas Jefferson once told a friend, no nation has ever existed or been governed without religion. 
nor can it be. The Christian religion is the best religion that has been given to man, and I, as chief magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson on June 28, 1813, The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Teddy Roosevelt said the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure to ourselves what life would be, or yeah, what that life would be if these teachings were removed. Woodrow Wilson said America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Herbert Hoover said, American life is built and can alone survive upon the fundamental philosophy announced by the Savior 19 centuries ago. But consider the average American's lack of knowledge about the foundation of this country. It's truly terrifying. I, let me tell you something. Though. Some of the things that people say, I don't know. It's concerning that they go out and vote. It really is. It's concerning. It's all, I, I hate to say it, but I feel like you should have to pass a civics class in order to get in that voting booth. It's crazy, the ideas and the things that people think and believe just because somebody said it, right? Or they saw it on social media. What, what did we talk about there? What was it, last week or the week before? The Church of Social Media. Oh, boy. That's where a lot of these experts are. But respecting those voices of the past, we need to find, we need to have the same understanding as uh, uh, Josiah Bartlett, right? He was, a, he was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and he said this, called on the people to confess before God their aggravated transgressions and to implore his pardon and forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, that the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ may be known to all nations, pure and undefiled religion, universally prevail and the earth be filled with the glory of the Lord. That was a, 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 for the Proclamation Day uh, fasting and prayer. That was March 17, 1792. A people of God who are willing to confess their sins and turn from them are equipped to withstand the attacks of our enemies. We've heard this before, right? The Bible tells us, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's Matthew 16, 18b. That's the second part of 16, 18. Matthew Henry said it like this. The Lord affirms that death will have no power over the members of the church. When all has been said and done, you will see no evil designs had stopped the work of the Lord. <laughs> right? Stop and think about it. Has the enemy ever stopped the work of the Lord? Nope. He went on to say, The Lord will secure the labors of his saints. Satan's lies will not overcome God's truth, and our endeavors will reach its end. All fights being raged against the church's principles will be defeated in the end. What seems like victory won by Satan now will end in defeat. There will be a church to hold back the forces of evil, until everything on this earth has run its course. See, he's talking about the church there. That <laughs> the enemy cannot prevail against Christians, against God, and run amok until his church has been removed. I kind of touched on this not too long ago. And, you know, we talk about being raptured out of here. See, the Antichrist can't really go crazy on this earth as long as his church is here. We're going to see some crazy stuff. We will see that happen. Um, like I said, I believe that we're seeing the things go on right now. The spirit of Antichrist has been here forever, right? But see, that spirit of Antichrist is going to jump into a man or woman, whatever. It's going to jump into a, a, a fleshly vessel and begin to wreak havoc. When God pulls us out of here, rapture, you know, when we when we're raptured out of here, there's no more prayer like that to hold it back. Now I've told you that there will be those people who will be saved in those end times. But I don't want to say saved, they will receive the Lord. The time for saving is over. They're going to go through those trials and tribulations. Don't be one of them. Don't 
Don't be one of them. Just receive Jesus. All the good things that he's done for you. That's how we get out of that. But we're going to start seeing some crazy stuff. This is just the beginning of it, guys. The Congress, right? The U.S. Judiciary Committee of 1854 wrote this. I want you to listen to this. This was interesting. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. Wow, right? In this age, there could be no substitute for Christianity. That was the religion of the founders of the republic, and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. That was found in the reports of committees of the House of Representatives made during the first session of the 33rd Congress. Guys, like I said, somewhere around 1900, things just snapped. Something changed. I, I believe the infiltration of the enemy into the church, this feel-good feeling thing, like I said earlier, something happened. A war against the church will not prevail, and our founding fathers knew that. They were also willing to pay the cost for the freedoms that we enjoy today. We know that true freedom and liberty is found in Jesus Christ, and they knew that. They laid down their lives knowing that this is where true freedom came from. I actually did a message one night about that. They knew all these things, and they laid down their lives, right? They loved not their lives until the death. But the voices from the past are whispering that this is a Christian nation, one purchased through sacrifice, bloodshed, and as like I said, out of that reverent fear of the Lord. See, the Bible tells us, this is Psalm 128, verse 1 through 4. It says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. Amen. Train up your kids. Train up your sons. I'm telling you right now, I, <laughs> Tristan is an organ as patriot as I. I I'm going to tell you right now, I, the kids did something at graduation last year, and I, I showed it to all the guys, and <laughs> they were like, that's awesome. But see, you have to raise them up right. You've got to tell them these things. You got to share with them. You got to take them places like Colonial Williamsburg and show them what's going on out there, right? Psalm 34, 7 and 9, the, those verses tell us this. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing, right? He is our provision, he is our strength. John Dickinson was another signer of the Constitution, and he knew this truth, right? He said this in his last will and testament on March 25th, 1808. It says, Rendering thanks to my Creator for my existence and station among his works, for my birth in a country enlightened by the gospel and enjoying freedom, and for all his other kindnesses, to him I resign myself, humbly confiding in his goodness and in his mercy, through Jesus Christ, for the events of eternity. <laughs> How often do you find that in, in a last will and testament these days? The guy's talking about Jesus when he's telling everybody his last wishes. He's praising God and giving thanks for being born in a nation that embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. But see, again, like I said, we're going to be talking about this in the coming weeks. I may go in a little really in-depth on Sunday. I don't know. i got to i got to pray about this and see how we're going to do this. But I bring all this up because of the things I see going on. The chipping away at our freedoms. When we talk about that First Amendment chipping away, we see the attack on the church. Again, you, it doesn't have to be uh, an outward assault. It doesn't matter. I had mentioned earlier about how the new norms, right? They're implying that there are going to be new norms. Well, what, are, what do you think the new norms are going to be? This? Like, everything's going to be a sermon on, online, and we're not going to assemble? No. No. And again, any attack against the church cannot 
prevail, right? We are believing Christians. We pray and we pray with a, a fire in our hearts that beats the enemy back. But see, again, like I said, Vindicki, what I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is not something new. I, I have to say it this way. I'm not touting my horn here or anything. I'm just saying that I would not know. This is what, what, what Pastor Nikki and I really talked about last night. I would not know the things that I feel without the guidance of the Holy Spirit about these things. My first hit of talking about authority came one night out of nowhere. My, my, my dear brother uh, Bob was on one side of me and, and brother Steve was on the other side of me when it happened. It, it just launched me into an exhaustive study of biblical authority. And I never knew until recently that this was these are things that were preached, like I said, 250, 300 years ago. Faith and politics are the same thing. See, the, this, this, the, this world, the enemy wants to separate that, this, the separation of church and state. It doesn't say that in the Constitution. Again, that was a discussion in Federalist Papers. But see, they want it to be there. The enemy and his minions want it to be there so they can weaken the church, weaken the nation, cause a divide. You're seeing it now. So I'm going to talk about these things. We're going to go in depth with this. And I hope that by the time I get through this, you have a true understanding of what biblical authority really means. It is spiritual authority, but it's also authority that manifests itself in the flesh. And I want you guys to start to think about these things. What you're seeing going on in the world, right? We talk about our prayer lives. We pray, but where do we see healing manifest? In the flesh, right? We're on our knees praying in the spiritual realm. It manifests in the flesh. So too does biblical authority. It starts in the spiritual realm and manifests in the flesh. So I hope somebody got something from this tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know that you you guys really like it. When I, I a lot of people comment, a lot of people message me and say, you know that they like these quotes, they like these things, they like hearing about these things. And it's true, it's all true. But you need to understand something. You're a believer first. You're under God's authority first. The rest of this world, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. It doesn't it doesn't pertain unless it's biblical, unless it's a godly authority on this earth doesn't really carry a whole lot of weight to a, to a believer. So, again, I hope you guys got something from this. And, uh, you know, I want you to stay safe out there. <sighs> it's crazy out there, guys. Stay safe. Be prepared in season and out. Amen. Take your precautions, but stay strong in the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we always say our salvation prayer at the end of every service. So we're going to say that tonight. If anybody, if it's the first time watching, you know, if you've never said it, we're going to say these words together. Say them. This is a, this is a first step to going into that journey to be with Jesus, to pressing in closer to him and developing that relationship. It's going to open up a life that you just never knew was there. And I hope that you do embrace it. If you've said this before, if you've received Jesus before, but you've backslidden or you're just not living for God now, and you know, say it again. Re rededicate your life to the Lord. Say these words with us. And again, get back on that path. I tell everybody all the time, Jesus, God, is just never further than a whisper away. Amen? So let's say this together. My dear God in heaven, I believe today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross. And he rose on the third day, and sits at your right hand. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And thank you for receiving me today into your kingdom and forgiving me of all my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. It's that simple. It, is, it really is. Everything I said is true. Uh, if you have questions, you can always reach out to Pastor Mickey and I here at the church. Um, you know, we're always available. You know, through the Advent, the, the internet, and everything. We, we're always online. We always get the messages right away. So reach out to us if you have any questions or you need anything. 
Um, like I said, you know, you guys can reach out to me if I don't cover something in this 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 talk about you know these messages about biblical authority. And you have a question, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to answer you. That brings us to the uh, tithes and offerings portion of our uh, service. You know, and again, thank you for those people that are sending them in, continuing to send them in. The work of the ministry doesn't end. Uh, we still do our, our thing here. Um, we just we just want to get back into into our services and, and meet everybody and, and assemble as we're supposed to. But again, we keep this this portion very simple here. Again, I say I said it last week. I don't like to stand up here and ask for money. That, that's just something I, I I don't like doing. You do what God tells you to do. All right. So I'm not going to ask you for anything. I'm just telling you that when you seek God and he puts something in your heart to make your tithe, make your offering, we always read this one, one portion of scripture, and it's called the cheerful giver, because that's how God wants you to give, right? And I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm not going to stand here and contradict God in any way. So do it with a cheerful heart. Seek God first before you ever click on the give button or write a check, okay? So we're going to read this together, right? 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. And it says this, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you're enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Can't put it any more simple than that, guys. You know, all like I said, all the money that, that comes in, you know, we, we really are, are saving the money. We're trying to get a building together. A build, you know, we want to do that. We want to have our own place and be able to meet whenever and do whatever, and, and that's the way that it is. So if you're ever wondering where your money's going, you can always reach out to Pastor Nikki. She's the one that does it. I, that's one thing I don't know. I don't know who gives. I don't know who doesn't give. I don't know how much anybody gives, and that's the way that I want it. Pastor Nikki handles our finances here, and we're actually thankful because Carolyn will be taking care of that when she finally retires. Amen. So for that, we're very grateful too. So, but let me just pray over you guys tonight, and uh, you know, I, I, I want you to to really begin to ponder these things this authority thing. I, I, I can't tell you how much you will become stronger in your faith when you truly understand how this works. So let me pray over you. And then until we uh, gather again here on the internet on Sunday, ponder these things, knowing that we pray for all of you every day. And uh, we miss you. So, <laughs> all right, everybody bow your heads. Father, thank you for this time together tonight, that your word could go forth, that the message just touched somebody in a special way. Father, open up their hearts. Let them begin to understand the message that you want me to pour into them. I pray that it bolsters their faith, Father, that they begin to press closer to you, knowing that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he turned that over to his church, as your word tells us. Father, like it opened me up in prayer, let it open each one up that is that is watching this, that they, they just, oh, just lights a fire within them, Father. We pray over the families that are watching this, those that are watching this, Father, that they be protected, that if there's sickness among them, that it be broken in the name of Jesus. 
Father, those that are watching this, they just don't know. I lift them up before you. Send your Holy Spirit. Put workers in their path that they begin to understand the power that we find in you and we know is in you and we rely on you for all of our provision, Father, for all of our protection. So, Father, I lift up the afflicted tonight. I lift up the sick before you, Father. I lift up the brokenhearted before you, Father, that they all just receive your loving mercy and peace, your supernatural healing, whether it be physical, Father, whether it be mental, whether it be just caressing their hearts, that they just need to feel the love of Jesus upon them. Father, I pray that upon every single person watching tonight. Father, I pray provision in this time that nobody's working, that you provide for them. Don't let them rely on the government. Don't let them rely on other things, Father. However you decide to get them their provision, Father, your will be done. However it is that you do that. For that, we are very very thankful. So we love you, Father. We thank you for protecting over, over us. We protect for our first responders. I couldn't imagine being one of them right now, Father. But thank you for their servants' hearts, that they're out there, that they're doing the things that they've been trained to do. Father, I lift my sister up before you. Keep her safe. Uh, I was just talking about Brother Harold. I know he was watching. The guy works a job, Father, and then he still goes out. It helps your people. So I pray protection all over all of those. Our first responders from Branchville, in our county, in our state, and in our nation. Father, lift them up. We lift them up. Just keep them safe and ever before your eyes, Father. We're thankful for these things. We love you. We honor and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.